drafted two quarterbacks in the NFL draft. Look, it feels absurd, but that's exactly the proposal that pro football focuses Sam Munson brought up in his mock draft that released early on Monday. So we're going to talk through it. We're going to talk about the pros. We're going to talk about the cons. We're going to talk about how realistic it is. And we're going to talk about the path to make it happen. Plus the unveiling of the all Forno team. I unveiled it earlier today on Purple Daily on Draft, and I wrote about it for the Sporting News, which went up around an hour ago. But we're going to dive a little deeper into some of those players and why they made the Alforno team. Welcome to The Real Forno Show. Welcome to The Real Forno Show. Hosted by Tyler Fornis, publisher at The Sporting News. Contributor on Score North Purple Daily. Publisher of Substack Run In Shooter. The host of The Good, The Bad, and The Hungry on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. And a founding member of Vikings First and Score. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Real Forno Show. I'm your host, Tyler Forno. It's with me as always in the top right corner. He is producer Dave, and we're not going to beat around the bush today. Let's jump right into it. If you hear Odie, I apologize. He is in the crate because Cheddar just got home from doggy daycare, and I want to make sure that he gets a little bit of alone time because, well, Odie's a spoiled little brat, so he can, he'll be okay. Um, Dave, we had an interesting mock draft, as I kind of mentioned at the top. Pro football focus is Sam Munson had the Vikings taking two quarterbacks and not just two quarterbacks. Like they took one in the top five and then they took one around six. No, they took two quarterbacks and here's how that process ended up working. According to Sam Drake may was the faller. He fell to ninth overall. The Vikings traded one away to the Chicago bears to move up to get there. And then they traded back from 23 overall with the new England Patriots to get 34 and 68. So that gives the Vikings a day two selection, two of them, in fact. And at 34 overall, they take Michael Penix Jr. Now, we don't know what that pick would have been at 68 because it was only a two round mock. But the idea here being that the Vikings tried to not just get a quarterback, they got two. So we're going to talk about that thought process on the outset, Dave, just kind of looking big picture, broad spectrum. What do you think about getting two quarterbacks that high in the NFL draft? I think it would cause a problem. How so? Because the first one, in this case, Drake May, would be assuming the he's going to be the one that starts role. But he's Mm -hmm. constantly got to be looking over his shoulder at Michael Penix going, hey, wait a minute, because as soon as he screws up and he's young and he's learning, he doesn't have that freedom to screw up like a rookie quarterback generally does because Mm -hmm. he's afraid that Michael Penix is going to come stepping in to save the day. And it might be too much pressure on the young man to do that. That's the first reason I think it's odd and probably won't happen. And the second reason is, when does Michael Penix get some reps? Right? Obviously, he would in preseason. But beyond there, he's just sitting there, clipboard, right? Probably behind Sam Darnold. And the mm-hmm. third, Jaron Hall's going, hey, what am I, chopped liver? And there's no development on-field development of Penix, not that there may have been in the first year anyways, but there's nothing there because he's got to wait and hope for, you know, an injury to Drake May. I don't think, I think it's almost too many cooks in the kitchen if you do it that way. Now, I see benefits from it. At least one is likely to hit. That's probably a true statement, but it's, it would be unconventional. Never been done with those that level of two high quarterbacks taken, right? Two quarterbacks have been taken before, and we, we've talked about that. RG3, and then later in the fourth round, 
Kirk Cousins. Mm-hmm. But that was first round and fourth round. That wasn't first round and top of the second round. Mm-hmm. But it'd be something. Yeah. It'd be, we'd definitely be talking about it. <laughs> yes, we would. Let, let's have a more in-depth conversation about the why behind it and some more historical precedent. Dave obviously mentioned the 2012 Washington commanders where they ended up taking Robert Griffin, the third second overall and fortify the position with Kirk cousins at, I believe it was 102 or 104. It was at the very top of the fourth round. So that was an interesting idea and it felt really weird at the time. It worked out because Kirk cousins turned into a uh, higher echelon quarterback. He turned into a player that they thought Robert Griffin, the third might, as far as like talent level, they thought RG three might be like a top five quarterback. That's why they ended up trading so much to go get him. But at the end of the day, they got a quality starting quarterback in Kirk cousins in round four. And that's, that's a big win. Anytime you have a starting quarterback that you don't pay a lot of draft capital to you win. And there is historical precedent otherwise. And it comes in the form of the 1989 Dallas Cowboys where the Cowboys ended up taking Troy Aikman first overall out of UCLA. And then in the supplemental draft, they bid a first round pick for quarterback Steve Walsh from the university of Miami. That matters here because Jimmy Johnson had just come from the university of Miami. So he knew Steve Walsh. Well, theory being one of these guys is going to be my quarterback and we're going to hit. So I'm going to hedge my bet. Aikman was a little bit of a wild card, even though the talent was just absurd coming out of UCLA. He hit big time hall of fame quarterback, three super bowl wins. It, the story really writes itself. So what did they do with Walsh in September of his second season? They traded him to the new Orleans saints for first and third round picks in a conditional second round pick in 1992. That conditional second round pick could turn into a first round pick based on playing time. I don't know if it ended up becoming a first round pick, but in my opinion, that really doesn't matter that much. Why doesn't it matter? Because the first and third round pick already supersedes that first round pick that you gave up for him. And then it's a second round pick as well. That's a massive home run to be able to get that guy. And things are a little bit different now. The landscape at quarterback is significantly different. The landscape of the NFL is different. How draft capital is treated is different. Because remember, Jimmy Johnson created what's viewed as like the first draft value chart. It's called the Jimmy Johnson chart. And teams did not value draft picks in the same way. That is how the Herschel Walker trade happened. The Vikings did not value the draft picks in the same way that Jimmy Johnson did. And Johnson built a Super Bowl winner out of it. So that kind of changed everything. Nowadays, if you were to draft a quarterback high and then move on from him the next year, the only way you're going to be able to do that is if you drafted CJ Stroud and Anthony Richardson back to back, and then you were able to flip one of them because, but the other guy is still really, really good. So teams will probably bid for him. Like that's the only way you're going to be able to get that any kind of really good return. So if you took Penix and may let's say may hits. Okay just to make it easier say, cause the higher draft pick should theoretically hit easier than the lower draft pick. That's just how probability works. That's how skill works. And a good comparison would be the Arizona Cardinals traded Josh Rosen one year after taking him 10th overall, they got pick 62 back in return. And Rosen wasn't even that impressive as a rookie, but they wanted Kyler Murray. They had a new regime coming in who prioritized Kyler. Murray, they wanted to run an offense through Kyler and Kyler knew the offense they were going to run. So you sell high on an, or I guess low on an asset and that asset happened to be just quarterback. So if the Vikings wanted to do this, there is some precedent. Theoretically, it should increase your chances of hitting on a quarterback by around 20 or 25%. So if it's 40% with just Drake may that'll go up to about 60 or 65% by adding Penix. That is a significant amount of capital to give up, but it's also a significant amount of extra leeway when it comes to the quarterback position. And this is just looking at it from a big picture perspective, a probability perspective. But now we have to talk about the opposite side. 
and something that Miles Gorham brought up on Purple Daily on Draft earlier today. The human element. If Dave and I are both on the team, I believe in Drake May. Dave believes in Michael Penix. That can create real friction in a locker room. There's the Bill Parcell saying, if you have two quarterbacks, you have none. And any team that's had a quarterback controversy knows this all too well. The Cleveland Browns kept flip-flopping during Tim Couch's rookie contract between Couch and Kelly Holcomb. Some people wanted Kelly Holcomb. Some people wanted Tim Couch. And that created real friction. Anytime you have those type of quarterbacks where it's, you're just not sure who's better or who's worse, it can be a real problem. And to me, that is the one area where I just think as much as analytics says, Hey, you can take this bet. You can make it, you can do this, that, or the other thing to try and maximize. It does not take into consideration the human element. And I think that's really important because data cannot quantify properly what that human element is. And I think that's a really important factor here because if you can't figure out what the human element is for that specific instance, well, I don't know, man. Like it, it's, you can't, if you can't solve the variable, then how, how can you sincerely make the deal? That's to me, one of the biggest things. And I don't think I would take the, the chance of taking two quarterbacks like that. I get the draw. I think if Kwesi Dofomensa, and this is where it becomes really intriguing. He is a finance guy. He is from wall street. What do guys who are money guys do often? They diversify and they hedge and they don't put all their eggs in one basket. So theoretically, Kwesi Dofomensa may think the same thing where quarterback is an asset and I need to hedge my bet and I need to diversify my holdings to try and make sure I get the guy. But you're dealing with humans. You're not dealing with corporations. You're not dealing with like 3M where you think 3M is going to grow 30% quarter over quarter and they, and then they end up only growing 10%. So then you uh, invest into general mills. Like, it doesn't work that way. And the human element here is so, so important when having these conversations that even though it may make sense with numbers and on paper, it's just not a great idea unless you're going to go the Washington route where you take a guy in round four and you'd be like, hey, we got a backup. But then you're also saying that you completely give up on Jaron Hall, which I think it was Justin said way earlier in the chat. Or maybe it was Josh. I can't remember. Um, said that the Vikings would basically be giving up on Hall if they were to end up doing that. And that's a very, very good point. I don't think they're ready to give up on Hall. I don't think Hall... Look, he had a disastrous start against Green Bay. Nobody is going to say any uh, anything else. But he played well enough in his limited time against the Falcons. And he was a rookie. So it wasn't like he was a fourth-year guy or a third-year guy where he's had a lot of time in the building and he's had time to really learn and develop and kind of work on some of that mechanical stuff. He was a rookie fifth round pick. Those guys shouldn't start, but he had to because of injuries. So that's kind of the way I look at things. You just can't do it with the human element. It's, it's too much. And if they were to try, okay, let's kind of see what happens, but I don't think it's the best idea. Well, that's what all these private uh, meetings with these quarterbacks have hopefully helped determine. If they determine that, hey, they want a Batman and Robin style of quarterback backfield and that both those players are cool with it, then it might work. But, um, you know, I doubt that's even brought up during the one-on-ones with these guys. It would surprise the heck out of me. I th- I think this is just a, one of those, if you run 200 simulations or 2,000 simulations, it's the one in 2,000 that happens. So I don't think we need to take it, you know, as serious, but it's an interesting thought process. 
or thought exercise. It's very, it's a very, very interesting thought exercise. And having that conversation is, I think, really important because you want to look and explore all avenues. You want to look and try to figure out, okay, how can I make this team better? How can I take where the Vikings are at now and make them a really good team moving forward? And for me, it, it's a very complicated answer because there's just so many different factors going into it. But the two quarterback thing, good on paper, not good in practice. It, it kind of reminds me of National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation when um, Cousin Eddie kidnaps uh, Clark's boss and Clark's boss admits, you know what? Taking rid of Christmas bonuses look good on paper, but when you see how it impacts like real families, it doesn't matter anymore because the human element is missing from data. And that's why you have to marry data with the, the human element, which is why visits and interviews are so important along with the film. It all matters. They all matter to different degrees, but you really can't not have one. You have to have all of it. And that, I think that's really important. I agree. All right. Let's have a conversation, Dave. It is time for the real, sorry, the all Forno team. So you sing the real Forno show that I I, I goof that up. Cheddar's excited. Cheddar's the all my feet. Forno team for 2024. That was some interesting music. A little jazzy. I need to figure out how to yeah. plug more stuff into the hot pads on the broadcaster. Yeah, you'll get there. And hey, you know what? That's what the off season is for. Because we're, that's exactly we'll, we'll, what the off season's for. We're still planning on having two shows a week, but some Wednesdays. Yeah, we'll see. We'll we need out. we need a break too. Let's let's just let's just be honest. So that's why you're gonna want to like, comment, and subscribe. And when you subscribe, ring the bell because this off season we may be doing shows at random times. I got, I had to get go get a job bartending, so we may have to be a little flexible on what time we do shows, and then that'll at least let you know that we have them, and then you can check them out at your own convenience. But subscribing is the best way to help the show, and. Always remember, Super Chats are appreciated. We know a lot of you love to be able to help us out and support us in that way. Super Chats will also help um, get your questions answered pretty much immediately on the show. And we love to be able to help answer all questions you have. And if you join uh, the YouTube channel as a member, there will be opportunities like we did last Wednesday where those members can join the show. Yeah, it was Patrick Harms came on. Mm Mm-hmm. Any member can join the show and it's, and that's another great way to support the show. So lots of great ways to do it, but the easiest one, the free one is just liking, subscribing and commenting. Tell me what your favorite food is in the comments. I've got quite a few favorite foods. It really just depends on my mood right now. It's probably French fries. I love me a good French fry. Yeah. Nice little promo. Now, Let's get to the all-forno team. There are only three requirements for the all-forno team. I have to just love watching your film. I have to just really, really enjoy it. That's number one. If I don't enjoy it, you have no chance. Two, I limit it to two players per position. That's the max. Doesn't it, I don't even have to have one from a certain position, but if I have two from a position, then I cap it. Because I don't want it to just be, oh, I love five wide receivers. No, that, that, two per position. And lastly, only two players that have first round grades. Because everybody loves really good tape. But this isn't about who's really good or who's not. This is about fun. I have on the all Forno team, two first round grades. Uh, I believe three or four third round grades. And then two or three uh, second round grades all day one and day two guys, because I didn't get a lot into what the day three portion of the class was going to look like just because of time. This, this job is very fun, but with the amount of writing that I have to do it, 
it makes it difficult. And it makes it difficult to really be able to put in all the time to watch these players. And to me, it's about the quality over the quantity. I would rather give you 100 players where I can give you real thoughts than have 250 guys where I'm just kind of half-assing it. So that's kind of how I approach this. And eight guys made the all Forno team this past year. Eight guys. And Norse VS, please super chat. Fat Hawkinson needs a treadmill. No, I don't need a treadmill. I just need to have time to go to the gym. That I don't have. I don't have time to get to the gym. But I am going on multiple walks with the dogs a day, so I'm working on it. All right. Do we want to start with the captain, Dave, or do we want to fit, wait, save that for last? Save him for last. Okay. I will tell you that previous captains, the 2022 all 4 team, captain by Ohio State wide receiver Chris Olave, which I feel very justified that he was the first, or sorry, he was wide receiver one in that class. Talk to me all you want about Garrett Wilson. Chris Olave all day. Um, 2023, another wide receiver. North Carolina's Josh Downs. Downs was awesome. Um, I loved his game. I thought he could be a real outside wide receiver, but he's probably going to play a lot in the slot moving forward for multiple reasons, because mostly because of his size. But they asked him to do a little bit of everything. And this year, we'll get to the captain in a little bit. We're going to start backwards. We're going to start on defense, and we're going to move toward the offensive side of the football. We're going to start with Notre Dame cornerback Cam Hart. Hart is a fascinating football player. 6'3", 204 pounds, 33-inch arms. He's the height, weight, speed guy. Um, I had a similar player to him in Julius Brents on the all four team last year. He went to third round to the Indianapolis Colts. I really liked Hart, and I thought his film against Marvin Harrison Jr. was really, really, really impressive. They did a fantastic, fantastic job in really maximizing that defense and utilizing Cam Hart because Hart himself is a really talented football player. But one of the big things with Hart, he's scheme diverse. And I wanted to see him a little bit more aggressive in man coverage. But one thing that really fascinated me about him is something that kind of fascinated the Seattle Seahawks about Richard Sherman. And I don't think Cam Hart's Richard Sherman. Don't, don't put that out there. But one thing Richard Sherman has is he didn't run the fastest 40, but he was long and he could impact plays. Even if he was behind, because when you have long arms, makeup speed is a little bit less important or a little bit less vital because you can make up for it with length. And Cam Hart has some of that to him. And I think when you play in a hybrid style defense, which right now the coverages of the Vikings run are pretty hybrid. They want to do more man coverage, but they don't feel they have the guys to do it. So they're running a lot of zone and they have to have guys who can attack the football. Hart is one of those guys. I loved watching his tape. I think that he can be a long-term starting cornerback in the national football league. And you can put him in zone. You can put him in man. He's much more fluid in his transitions than I anticipated for a guy that size, but he's got everything. He could be gone by pick 50. He could be around at 108. I genuinely don't know what to expect with his draft stock. So that's kind of where I'm sitting. Uh, I love Cam Hart and we'll talk about one more cornerback. Jarvis Brownlee Jr. Cornerback out of Louisville. And what's fascinating is when I watched this film, his teammate Quincy Riley was arguably better than Brownlee. And he's going to be in next year's draft class. Brownlee, he is like a little pit bull, but like a pocket-sized pit bull. Like uh, Cheddar's got a little bit of pity in him too, but pities are not aggressive by nature. They can be taught to be aggressive. And they are very defensive dogs. Where that's where Cheddar is. If he feels he's under attack, he will defend himself. Brownlee is kind of like a smaller size because he's 5'11", or sorry, 5'10", 194. Doesn't have the prototypical size, but he has the, all the dog in the fight. And he will be aggressive. He will be feisty. He will get up in your face. He will punch you in the mouth and ask for seconds. 
I think he would be best in a scheme that really prioritizes him in man coverage where they can attack, 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 but they don't necessarily have to be like only have him in zone coverage or in man coverage. You can use him in zone. You can do a lot of different things with him. And I think that's a really big benefit to Brownlee, but you also have to figure out when you have the conversation about Brownlee, is his aggressiveness going to cost him in the national football league? And I think that's a very valid and fair question. Are you going to be able to take advantage of what he is in the NF or in the NFL? Are you going to be able to bait him? He's got to find a way to hone that aggressiveness, be in control. There's some people who are just not in control. And when they lose control, that's when you could take advantage. Well, if he stays in control within himself, he's not going to be able to be beaten with some of those things like you might see with other players who are just hyper aggressive. You have to be able to calm it and control it. And that's going to be, I think, his biggest challenge in the NFL. But if he can solve it, I love, 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 love this game. Any thoughts on the corners, Dave? Oh, I'll, I'll take your selections. I don't think we're going to get any, but as the Vikings, I don't think they draft them, but we'll see. We could use more in the room. I but think they'll draft three. one. I really think they're going to draft one corner. Remember, they have nine picks. Corner right. is not a super pressing need, but it's a need nonetheless. But I think they I find like a way to draft one. You can find one in day three that turns out to be somebody. Mm-hmm. A lot of time that happens with corners. They don't have to be oh, first yeah. round picks. I agree. They don't have to be first round picks and they can do a lot of different things. So I'm intrigued to kind of see what that looks like, what the Vikings could end up doing at corner. But those are two guys. If they're available at 108, I'm pounding the table. Now let's go to the defensive line where I have two guys. First one is no tackle to Vondre Sweat. The big guy. And I know that he had the DWI. And remember, this is just a, I just loved watching the film. And I think I have a type when it comes to some of these defensive linemen, which is why I love sweat. Even though the dude cannot deal with a double team, he really struggled in that way. Um, he can't sense the double. He struggles fighting off him, holding his position. And being 364 pounds is a little bit of a concern. Here's what he does do well, Dave. Shoot gaps. The dude played a lot of three technique with Byron Murphy being the nose tackle because Murphy did such a good job holding up against doubles. But for 364 pounds, he can rush the passer and get off the ball really, really quick. And I had a great time watching him do that. Imagine a 364 pound guy just getting all this force and momentum built up and being able to go right after your quarterback. It was a lot of fun to watch. There's some real flaws. That quarterback. Well, for everybody else, it's fun. Um, <laughs> yeah, there was there, there is some real concern about some of those things I mentioned, the double teams and stuff. But man, I enjoyed the film. And getting arrested for a DWI is going to hurt his draft stock. It's not going to take him off the real 4 0 team because that's not what this team is about. Now, I mean, if he was charged with something incredibly heinous, I'll, I'll take him off. But Tavondre Sweat, really intriguing player. And the next guy is also really intriguing. His name is Marshawn Neeland, edge from Western Michigan. I usually have a, 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 a group of five edge on this group. Peyton Turner would have been on the all Forno team if I had one in 2021. He would have captained the all Forno team. I loved his film. Absolutely loved it. And Neeland kind of does some of the same things. He weighs about 15, 20 pounds less than what Turner did, but they used him everywhere at Western Michigan. I saw him as a stand-up defensive tackle. I saw him as a wide nine. I saw him everywhere in between. And he can do a lot, a lot, a lot of different things. And I thought his get off the ball was really impressive. I thought he could beat blockers in multiple ways. He, He needs some refinement, but the athletic tools are there. The size is there. The length is there. The want is there. I just loved Marshawn Neeland. And I think 
I, I'll be honest. I knew nothing about him going into senior bowl. Talked to a friend of the show, Devin Jackson and oh buddy. Uh, Devin's like, yeah, this dude can ball. Took a look at some film. Yep. He can ball. He can flat out ball. And it was really, really impressive to watch. One guy that almost made the, the Alfarno team that didn't. Darius Robinson from Missouri. Oh, man, if the Vikings see up with Darius Robinson, I'd be so happy. He can play anywhere from like a, a zero or one technique on pass rush downs to a wide nine. Um, doesn't quite have the right amount of athleticism you want for a guy to play a traditional edge, but you slide him into five technique and a three technique role and really ask him to play the defensive front instead of an edge. And you can be versatile. You can put him at wide nine. He has a 19.8% win rate as a wide nine. He's got 35 and a half inch arms. He's 6'5", 286. There's some, a lot to like there, but he didn't make the team because I only was going to take two guys from the defensive front. Now, I take we got one on the Vikings. Oh, me too. Let's go. Let's go. We got one more round belly left, Dave. And he wears a crop top. Troy Fautanu from the University of Washington, left tackle. A lot of people don't think Fautanu can be a tackle or Fountaineau. I, I, however you pronounce his name, he's 6'3 and 5'8, I think 314 pounds. That tells me, but dude but he has 34 and a half inch arms. He's got the length to play tackle. He's got great tackle tape. And because he's a little bit shorter, he can win leverage battles, Dave. And I think that's, what's really impressive for me. He, because he is so short, he has to bend lower, not as low than other guys. And he can get up underneath the pads. And because of that, I really don't have too big of a concern when it comes to, uh, him as a left tackle. I think he can play it. I also think he can be great at guard, but he has the length and he has the movement skills. He can redirect like crazy. He can deal with stunts. Well, he can get in front of you and mirror tremendously with his feet. And overall, the movement skills are just absurd. So I would let this guy fail at tackle. I also think that you could play him at guard and it wouldn't be too big of an issue. What well, might with- help him? The is, height at tackle is tackle's going to do a quick step um, or a kick step. They're trying to gain as much ground when they step back for pass blocking as possible. What, does he have, you say he has leverage, but does he has the mm-hmm. propensity to be, be beaten by speed guys that are going to zip around because he isn't the 6'5", 6'6", 6'7" normal height tackle. You know what? I think I I saw some flaws with that. I'm actually going to look up his scouting report really quick to make sure that I'm saying it right. But he is 16th on my big board right now. And he's offensive tackle six. So like this offensive tackle class is just that absurd. Um, So is his biggest thing is he bends at the waist with speed rushers. He has the foot speed to get there. It's how he, he utilizes his abilities in that speed rush game. So he bends a little bit. I think some of that might be the kick step, but you're talking the difference of an inch. He's got length. So that's really not that big of a concern. It like, I don't think it'll be too big of an issue for him. I think he might have to maybe have a uh, slightly wider split, but they also didn't do a lot of kick steps at Washington just based on how their offensive linemen played. So I don't think it'll be too big of an issue, but it is a very fair point to bring up. Well, and uh, kick step is a technique. It's not, not everybody does it. There's Mm -hmm. the constant. It wasn't what I was uh, primarily taught. It was mine was the pop, 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 shuffle as you're going out. But it's it's a technique to get you moved out quicker, faster, um, the way it works, and to keep your feet in position, a different style of position. And that's why the taller guys do it better because they have more oomph 
on that than the shorter ones. To me, just by his dimensions, uh, it tells me guard. And I'll bet whoever drafts him puts him at guard. Heck, we put I would let him, five, six, six guys at guard. I would let him fail a tackle, honestly. I think you have a guy who thrives at tackle, who has the measurables as far as like length and wingspan to play tackle, who has great tackle film. And he, he, you may want him to be an inch or two taller, but I would let him fail a tackle first. If he had 33 inch arms, I would be all for moving him inside the guard. But I think that's the biggest thing for me. He has it. And I think he can do it. Were there any other interior offensive linemen that made the all four no team? Nope. No more linemen. Just the one. Just the one offensive lineman. Your prejudice against them. Nope. I'm not prejudiced. I have I had three of eight in the trenches. So that's pretty good. Um, hey, well, let's answer this from Chris. What is your take on Jefferson not showing up yet? I don't care. Last year, he didn't show up to the voluntary workouts either. He showed up for everything mandatory. It's probably going to be the same thing. Dude is working out on his own, and he's making a bunch of money doing promotional stuff. He's fine. Don't even stress about it. People are going to try and make a big deal about it. Don't. doesn't matter. All right. Let's take a look. We have three players left, and they're skill position players. Let's go to running back. New Hampshire's Dylan Laube knew nothing about this guy other than, hey, there's this really interesting dual threat running back out of New Hampshire. Like, okay, flipped on the film. First game, he caught 12 passes for over 250 yards and a couple touchdowns. I'm like, what? What is this guy just housing screens? Nope. He's winning with slot fades. He's winning with out routes. He's winning with real receiver routes. I'm like, who is this guy? And I talked to him at the senior bowl and I asked him like, being a slot receiver isn't necessarily like something that's natural in the learning development and progression of a running back. How did this happen? How did you learn how to do this? How did you develop so well at it? And he said, yeah, they knew that I already had running back mastered of the offense. So like, Hey, you're going to go learn slot receiver. And this is during spring practice. So we did. And he became a more valuable asset to their offense. And they utilized him in every which way. He had almost 70 receptions this past year. He had um, 700 yards in rushing and receiving. And I believe he had like 15 touchdowns. Dude is a baller. And I think there's there were some questions about his athleticism. Is he athletic enough? It could be really hard to tell with FCS guys because the level of competition that you're comparing them to isn't very high. So you, it's really important to see the testing numbers to make sure that they match what you think you're seeing on film because it can be, you can misjudge them based on the level of competition. Now I tested really well. I ran a four, five, two explosive and agility drills were good. Um, I can't remember what his relative athletic score was or his RAS, but it was plenty good enough to believe that I think he can succeed at the position. And I think Labe can come in and be a third down guy right away and he can develop into a well-rounded running back for you. And I absolutely love it. I think he's great. I know we featured him on one of the shows. He was pretty good. Mm -hmm. He's He's from UNH. And how often does UNH have New Hampshire, by the way? How often do they have somebody get it, make it all the way to the pros? It's rare. I think they've only had four or five players drafted in program history. Mm -hmm. It's not their hockey. Oh yeah. Fun fact. Chip Kelly uh, was the head coach at New Hampshire at one point in time. That him running that offense at New Hampshire is how he got the job at Oregon. And then he parlayed that into getting the job at Philadelphia. And then he went back to the college game after one year in San Francisco UCLA, and now he's the offensive coordinator in Columbus. So he's doing he's doing well for himself. Um, two more guys left. The second first round prospect, and I was not expecting to give this guy a first round grade. And he is my fourth wide receiver overall, and that is Adonai Mitchell out of Texas. 
don't let the analytical profile or some of the things that fantasy people will kind of throw at you, hinder you from really being excited about this guy. And if you're going to throw at you, Oh, he doesn't have a great yards per run. He doesn't have a great target share. Well, why it's not like he stinks at Georgia. He's in a run first offense with a quarterback who does not drive the ball super well down the field. And Brock Bowers is on the team. So he's not a high priority despite showing off really well in the college football playoff. And then he goes to Texas for this past year and his quarterback is Quinn Ewers. Ewers can't drive the football down the field and he wasn't very good. And then you also had Xavier worthy. Who's another fringe receiver. You had Jonathan Brooks who probably goes in the second round of running back Jatavian Sanders at tight end. There were a lot of mouths to feed in a offense that was run first. So to me, that plays a lot into it. And that that's a really, really big factor. So I'm not really that concerned with it. If you're going to use stats like yards per route run and target share, you have to understand the why behind it. Why was the target share so poor? It's not just look at that stat and say yes or no. It's look at that stat and understand where it comes from. How are you deriving that stat? Why does it matter? Why does it matter for other guys? Like Romo Dunze only had like a, what, like a 30% target share this past year and he had 1,600 yards. He only had like 30% of the production. Well, he's got two other receivers on that team that could go in the first 64 picks. That matters. It matters a lot when you have that kind of talent on your team. And it's not as simple as, oh, this guy, he's that good. He should just be doing it. Well, that's not always how it works. Like Malik neighbors didn't exactly have a significantly higher target share. And he had some really good players on that roster. I don't think it matters when he had to and Adonai Mitchell balled out when he had to as well. And he was the guy that they trusted at the end of that Washington game to try and score. He was the guy. And that matters. That kind of trust matters. And for me, that that's kind of the big thing. I love Adonai Mitchell. I think he's very good, but I also don't really care about some of the other stuff. It's just a different factor. It's, it's fine. I, I'm okay with the analytical profile the way it is. Doug, thank you very much for joining. Uh, we greatly appreciate you stopping in for the first time. We're going through the all Forno team. I'll kind of run down everybody before we reveal the captain. So far on the all Forno team, we got two cornerbacks, Notre Dame's Cam Hart. Louisville's Jarvis Brownlee Jr. And nose tackle, we have Texas's Tavondre Sweat. At edge, we have Western Michigan's Marshawn Neeland. Offensive tackle, we have left tackle Troy Fautanu. New Hampshire running back Dylan Labe. And Texas wide receiver Adonai Mitchell, who might be the smoothest mover I've seen at wide receiver in a long time, not named Justin Jefferson. All right, we got one more guy left. And he is the captain of the all Forno team. It is another wide receiver joining Chris Olave and Josh Downs as captains of the all Forno team. Western Kentucky is Malachi Corley. I love Corley. I think he's great. I think Corley has the potential to be a Debo Samuel in the national football league. Not only do I think the skill set matches, I think the size profile matches the athletic profile based on the film is similar enough. Corley didn't test. And I'm really worried that his 40 might be a little too slow, but it doesn't look slow on tape. So I'm going to just kind of have to go with the information I have. And it, it kind of stinks that we don't have that, but it is what it is. And he's a very interesting player. Two star recruit as a cornerback goes to Western Kentucky. They move him to running back. And then they move into a wide receiver and you see some of that running back in him, which is why you get a lot of the Debo Samuel comparisons. His average depth of target was like 5.8 yards. And that I might even be wrong on that. And that's too high. That's not good. You want your average depth of target to be over 10. Like some of the great guys will have their average depth of target at like 15. Corley played in a different offense. He played in an air raid. And in that air raid, they did a lot of yards after catch stuff. And that was Corley's bread and butter. 
his healthy season of 2022 because he dealt with some lingering hamstring ins- issues last year. He still had, I think, 22 missed tackles for us. 41 missed tackles for us at the wide receiver position. That's running back numbers. And he can break tackles easily. He can run you over. And he can create space for himself really well with good vision. Now, he also has some room to grow as a wide receiver. He hasn't exactly played wide receiver for very long. And that's to me is a really important caveat. If you haven't played receiver, that matters. It matters a lot because when you don't play a position, you don't have a lot of nuance to it. When you do play it, that is a learned thing. And I thought that he showed enough nuance on tape to make me excited about what his future is. And I want to see that future. I want to see what he can be in five years. And I think he can be great. He might be a little bit limited, but even so, I don't care. I know that I'm going to get a great guy after the catch who has already shown some growth with nuance and route running. And he really balled out and took advantage of the senior bowl and showed a lot of great stuff. So I'm all in on Malachi Corley. I've been in for a while. Do you want a Debo Samuel archetype? You take Corley and you try and make it work. And in an offense like the Vikings run, you run a lot of deep overs, a lot of in breakers. Corley can take advantage and make you a very, very happy franchise. We have a question from Dave L. Okay. I had one question. If you have the time, do you know why JJ McCarthy played in six games, only in six games in 2023? I just can't get behind him. He throws too hard when he doesn't need to, and that's not a good thing. Dave, I'm not quite sure what you're talking about. JJ McCarthy started all 15 games that the Michigan Wolverines played in 2023. Um, so I, I'm not quite sure what you mean. I know he didn't play in seven fourth quarters because the team already had a lead. Were you thinking somewhere along those lines? Um, so yeah, jump back in the comments and kind of let, let me know. Cause I'm not quite sure what you mean on that. Um, while we wait on that, uh, North CS has a nice super chat one. Thank you very much. Um, if we draft JJ McCarthy, Jane Daniels, I'll buy Dave and Tyler each a sweet bottle of bourbon. Um, oh. Hey, listen, I'd love that. So would I. Which is perfect because my bourbon preferences are more on the sweet side than they are on like the the real harsh bite side. Um, I don't oh, like barrel oh, proof. Spicy. I don't like weeded. Um, I like corn mash really a, a lot. Um, barrel seagrass is probably my favorite bourbon. That's I have like not, tried not that, like, but uh, ooh. that would be interesting because you know why they it's called seagrass. No. It's aged at sea, literally. Uh, they, well, I know the Jefferson Ocean is. I don't know if sea, ocean. I like. I thought seagrass was too, but I don't they, think seagrass is. Okay, but the uh, Jefferson Ocean is aged to sea, and I'm gonna try that because it's supposedly got salt. If you can sense it, and that's interesting to think about. I think that's I think that's <laughs> Jefferson Ocean, which is really good, by the way. I think you would really enjoy that, Dave. And where I will take a barrel proof, uh, I generally don't go with the 40 proofers. However, I enjoy drinking 40 proofers if they're good. I generally go for the higher proofs myself. But I do like Edwin Tuck's, he's with spicy bourbons. I like a high rye count in mine. And how it's done, you talk about a corn mash. If you get a sour or yellow, that's not my favorite. But however, you should get some red or blue. It all depends on where it's from. And the, um, how it's grown and all that, it all imparts flavor into it. And there's some that are better than others. So, mm-hmm. but I enjoy a good bourbon. And if it's free, all the better. Okay. 
so Davis saying to look at the box score uh, for JJ McCarthy. And I did. McCarthy played and started 15 games. I, I guess I'm I'm not quite sure what you mean. Um, ESPN, like he, like ECU, UNLV, Boiling Green, Rutgers, Nebraska, Minnesota, Iowa, or Indiana, Michigan State, Purdue, Penn State, Maryland, Ohio State, and then Iowa, Alabama, and Washington. He he played in all of them. So I'm not. I I, I I'd I'd love to hear more. Uh, kind of what you mean because I I'm I'm not sure. Um. Jaron asked this question and then uh, we'll probably call it a day. And Dave, if, if you don't get a reply up in the, um, the live chat, throw it in the real chat and, and we'll continue that conversation. Cause I'm really intrigued kind of what you're looking at. Um, Jaron asked, is anyone worried that McCarthy may just be Kirk cousins? I like him, but I can see it like eight, 12 best QB and never really the guy. Maybe I'll tell you what Kirk cousins on a rookie contract for four years is pretty valuable. Um, really and I valuable. I think that's the key is the rookie contract part of it. You know, people have said, well, let's develop um, our newest quarterback, Sam Darnold. You know, he was a third round pick and he plays for cheap and maybe he could become KOC can turn him into a fantastic starter. That's true. But then you'd lose. And would that work? Possibly. But at the end of the year, if he becomes that dude, he's demanding more money, and you don't get that rookie contract period to build the rest of the team, to build on the trenches, to build within um, mm -hmm. free agency. So there's a difference there. And you're gambling whether Sam Darnold is the guy. If he turns into the guy, you want the guy. I don't care how much it costs. You want the guy. But there's a there's a method to, well, if you get the rookie, now you can start filling in all those holes where we see on the defense and the interior offensive line that people want so badly to change. Me being part of that, uh, that that's the reasoning behind that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree there. Um, last question, then we're going to get out of here. Doug L asked any division three love this year. I'm going to be honest. I didn't get to any of the division three guys. There's apparently a wide receiver from Mount union is pretty good. Um, there's a couple D two guys, including another one from slippery rock that apparently has some NFL potential, but I just did not have the time to be able to get to a lot of the guys that I really wanted to. And that includes some of those really deep sleepers, but I will say, um, I will get to everybody that the Vikings draft. I will watch all of them if I haven't already. So that will come. And then we'll have some breakdowns on that. And we will have a lot of discussion on here moving forward. Um, we have another show Wednesday. We're going to try and get some, we were talking about doing this weekend, but it just never ended up happening. Um, uh, some uh, top 10 positions, position groups and talking about them. Um, and we'll also talk more next week about, uh, the latest, we may have a guest. I'm not 100% sure how we're going to handle next week yet, but we're going to have a lot of really interesting stuff leading into the NFL draft, including one last two old bloggers on Sunday, only four days before the NFL draft. You're not going to want to miss anything that we have going on. going to be a lot of really good stuff here on Vikings First and Skull. Like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell, all those things. It's absolutely free, and they help us out tremendously. I want to thank everybody for joining here tonight. And those of you listening on the podcast, we love you just the same. I'm Tyler. He's Dave. Skull Vikings, everybody. Skull Vikings. Like. Subscribe. And ring the bell to get notifications. It helps us grow this community. And we all love our Minnesota Vikings. And on behalf of Tyler Fornis, and myself, Dave Stefano, thank you so dearly for watching The Real Forno Show. Skull, everyone!